think we should um, kick off now. So um, let me begin by saying welcome. Welcome to you all. I'm delighted that you could all be here at the Career Development Virtual Science and Technology Expo. It's a brave new world for all of us. And I'm, as I say, thrilled that you're here. Um, just to let you all know that we are recording this session um, for the students. So, and it will be available on Career Hub for two weeks after today, from today. Um, I'm Lucy from the Career Development Centre, and it's lovely to welcome you all from Otago Regional Council. We have um, Jack Gray, who, and I, I don't have any info on you, Jack. You didn't send me anything else. What? <laughs> I have a habit of doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the recruitment and learning partner at the moment at the Otago Regional that. Council. I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. And would you like to introduce the rest of your team? I will let them introduce themselves because I'm cruel and vicious like that. So we'll start Good. with Sam because he's at the top of mine. Okay, good. Hi, Sam. Hi, um, I'm Sam Thomas. I'm the um, coastal scientist here at Otago Regional Council. Lauren. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren, and I am an environmental data officer at the Otago Regional Council. Kira. Hi. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko Kieran Campbell, ahau. Uh, I'm Kieran Campbell and freshwater ecologist at Otago Regional Council. Jason. I'm Jason Oxbury and I'm an environmental resource scientist at Otago Regional Council. And last but definitely not least, we have Rachel. Hi, uh, I'm Rachel Ozan and I'm a freshwater scientist at Otago Regional Council. Lovely. Thank you so much. Well, kia ora to you all and um, yeah, take it away with your fabulous presentation. So hopefully I can get it to work. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Wonderful. So this is basically our brief introduction. Oh, I shouldn't have apparently be allowed to do this at all. A uh, brief introduction about our council. So we're the Otago Regional Council and we are responsible for managing Otago's water. Um, land and air resources on behalf of our community. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, we're also responsible for the contract of passenger transport services. Um, so we have a whole transport team that are associated with us as well. Um, the council was established in 1989 when the Otago Catchment Board, Otago Regional Water Board and the Pest Management Boards, Noxious Plants Authorities and United Councils were amalgamated. Um, we also, as well as looking after the environment, we take into account the people of Otago, so the, the economic, cultural and social needs. Um, the next slide, now this is a video that sort of will give you a little bit of an overview on um, joining us and hopefully it will play. The things I love most about the ORC are the people that work there. Um, the diversity of all their jobs. We've got engineers and scientists and planners and admin people, um, a wide range of age groups. It's just an interesting bunch of people that are all here because they care about the environment and that's, that's pretty cool. I feel really um, lucky to be able to work with uh, skilled and usually very passionate people it's kind of a small organisation, so it's small enough that even though you don't see people every day, you kind of know their faces and you say hello in the corridor, and I really like that. What we all do is really important. I think there are a few things in the world that are as important as looking after the environment at the moment, so it's a special thing to be a part of. Got the most diverse landscape you could ever get. There's just so much going on between tourism, a lot of farmers out there, the high country, absolutely love the high country. It's, uh, it's diverse in many areas, and. Uh, yeah, it's a stunning, stunning place in the world to, to live and work. We actually have a chance to do something for the environment and make sure that it's all right for the future generations coming into Otago. The things I love most... Oh, there we go. Um, so further to that, sort of what we do, um, the Otago Regional Council, we care for Otago's environment. Um, our vision and basically our we mantra is that it's uh, we want a healthy environment, um, a connected community, an engaged and proud community, and a strong economy and a resilient region. So everything we do at Otago Regional Council is for the future of Otago. Um, some of the key policies and legislation 
um, that we have, uh, the, obviously the Treaty of Waitangi, um, a big one is the Resource Management Act, uh, Local Government Act, Biosecurity Act, National Policy Statements, Environmental Standards, Regional Policy Statement, Water Plan, Air Plan, Coast Plan, Waste Plan, um, and our strategy, so rural water, urban water, air quality and biodiversity. Um, our functions, uh, so we develop policies and plans to sustainably manage Otago's resources, um, making decisions on any resource consents that may come through to us. Uh, we monitor co compliance to make sure that those consents are being followed, uh, monitor the environment, respond to environmental incidents. Uh, we do the public transport, as mentioned earlier, for Dunedin and Queenstown, um, flood protection schemes, and also the civil defence uh, emergency management, which had a massive part to play in. Um, the recent COVID and continuing COVID crisis. Um, we have a really good relationship with our iwi. Um, we're in a special partnership with iwi under the Treaty of Waitangi and Resource Management Act. Um, and we work together and consult on a wide spectrum of the work that the Otago Regional Council undertakes. Um, we have two iwi representatives um, on the council's policy committee team and they have full voting rights. Um, our main priorities for uh, at the moment are our water, climate change, urban development and biodiversity and biosecurity. So the first person we've got coming up on our presentation is Kieran. So I'll let him take this away. Good afternoon everyone. Yeah, my name's Kieran and I joined Otago Regional Council as a freshwater ecologist in January this year. Um, so I've been here four months, two of which have been in lockdown. So. Um, I guess I consider my, my journey to be a little bit unconventional in, in terms of uh, trying to marry up employment and education and advance them by in tandem. So I guess a long time ago I started a, a Bachelor of Science um, and majoring in Ecology and Zoology at Mass University and I managed to pick up a couple of sub, summer contracts as a park ranger for Auckland Regional Council. Um, that, that sort of uh, really kicked off my employment there. Um, and I ended up shifting down to Dunedin and uh, got a role with Doc in Dunedin as a, as a freshwater ranger and a biodiversity ranger. Um, and while I was with Doc, I was studying a postgraduate diploma in wildlife management. Um, and more recently, yeah, I started with Otago Regional Council as a freshwater ecologist um, and I've been doing my Master's of Science for the last uh, year and a half on conservation genomics, so looking at uh, threatened fish. Um, so yeah, definitely what I would consider an unconventional pathway, but um, yeah, it got me here, so yeah. Um, life as a freshwater ecologist, uh, so with Otago Regional Council, I've only got a couple of months to base that off, um, but during the short time that I've been here, I've been lucky enough to be involved in sort of field surveys. So. Uh, being out uh, out in Otago and and having a look at ecosystems and species um, and reporting on those as well. Uh, a little bit of uh, GIS mapping and a uh, bit of data management and data analysis. Um, the GIS mapping was mainly around species and ecosystem distributions. Um, had a little bit of involvement in environmental monitoring and of course any of, any of those things come with a bit of project management. And um, I've also dipped my toes into assessing environmental impacts, and that's mainly for the resource consent process. Um, before you move on, Jack, um, that photo there was taken up on the Pisa Range. I was doing a, a site visit with some landowners up there and spent the day in, uh, yeah, in a glorious part of Otago. So, yeah. A little bit about LRC science. Um, so our motto is to provide scientific expertise informing decisions for Otago's future and um, I guess what that looks like for me is that part of our role is to understand and improve our natural environment. Um, we provide scientific advice for better outcomes and internally that looks like sort of sculpting and advising policy um, but also externally that looks like working with communities and stakeholders uh, and uh, something that I've noticed of, of, you know, lately is that there seems to be public and political pressure to improve the way New Zealand manages the natural environment. And what I think that 
entails is there's likely to be some industry upscale in that space. And that means that there's likely to be employment opportunities, which could result in graduate programs and things. Um, but essentially what I'm saying is we need you. Yeah, we need, um, you know, there's, there's, there's jobs there for, for people coming through environmental sciences. So yeah, that's me. Um, thanks. Right, I'm Jason Augsburg. Like I said, I'm an environmental resource scientist. Um, so what does council do? We've already covered this a little bit, but I guess more specifically, what do I do? Um, I'm a bit of an all arounder for council. So we've got people that tend to do just freshwater ecology um, and we've got people that do just water quality and just water quantity. Um, I do a bit of all of it. So I look at both quantity and quality. So how much water is coming out of the rivers, um, what nutrients are going into the rivers and what are the effects of that? Um, we provide research and expertise and that's both to internal people like the policy team perhaps or external stakeholders so it's reasonably common to get a phone call asking can i swim in this river at this time or why is the river green or what have you um, we help develop develop freshwater policy and so we do inform the policy team and what they're doing we inform the consenting team so if you want to take water out of the river you've got to come into us and ask us can we do it and then we look at what are the effects of doing so and then we'll come back to you um, and of course, once you put all those rules in place, they have to be enforced. So Otago Regional Council enforces them. So if those rules are broken, it'll land on my desk asking me, here's how the rules were broken. What does this actually mean? Was there any environmental effect? And is this something that we need to consider prosecuting? Next. So how did I get here? Um, you might have noticed from my accent, I'm certainly not a Kiwi. Um, I grew up in the US and I did a bachelor's with honors in wildlife and fishery science at South Coast State University. Um, from there, I went to Utah State University and I did all sorts of river surveys and stuff like that. And I was at South Dakota, I did all sorts of lake work. Um, put in an application to do a PhD at Otago and somehow ended up getting the scholarship. And so I think about a week after I got that, I got a visa and turned up here less than a month later. So that was great. And about the time that I was finishing my PhD, I started looking around for jobs and I had an interview with the Tug Regional Council the week I finished. So it all just fell into place quite nicely. Uh, if you want to hit the space bar. Throughout that entire time, I've been working with sort of applied agencies. So I'd worked with Nebraska Game and Parks, uh, South Dakota Game, Fish and Parks, the Utah Division of Natural Resources, US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, a bit of Waikato Regional Council during my PhD and DOC as well. So I'd always had this sort of academic background, but also a really applied experience. And so when I finished, I was really just excited to do something other than a PhD, to be honest. And so I was quite happy to stay in academia, but I was also quite happy to move on to something a bit more applied and sink my teeth into just about anything at that point. Next. So what does my day look like? Um, I've probably given some of you lectures because I tend to do a few of those at uni. Um, so you've probably heard this before, but I think it's really important when you're looking for a job is to consider what do I actually want to do? If you don't want to be a desk-based person, taking a desk-based job just isn't going to work for you. Um, so I think it's really important to understand what the job you're looking at does on a daily basis. So mine, it's pretty variable. Um, you get stuff like this where you're out doing field surveys. You might be looking at a dry river and looking at fish strandings, um, doing habitat modeling, looking at algal blooms and trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, next. Alternatively, you could be sitting at a desk looking at data. You could be doing coding and scripting. You could be analyzing huge and large data sets, um, reporting against national limits. So there's national limits for fresh water. So you might be comparing our samples to those. You could be creating graphs for the general public or scientific papers or reports. You could be writing reports. Um, next one. You could also be dealing with the media. Um, you could be dealing with stakeholders. So you could be out talking to stakeholders um, or you could even be sitting at the university giving a lecture. And so it's really quite a variable job where you could be doing anything from field work th right through to report writing and communicating um, and not only to scientific audiences, but the general public or stakeholders, which are in between the general public and um, a more scientific audience perhaps. Next. So why Otago Regional Council? Um, if you're interested in the environment, that's a good place to start. That's sort of our main thing that we've got to do. So it's quite good to have an interesting environment. Um, 
we are tasked with freshwater policy, consenting and enforcement. So it's quite, um, quite an operational space in freshwater. So if you're looking to maybe make a difference, that's a good place to be. Um, it's an extremely challenging research environment. And so you've got stakeholders on all sides of the debate. And one of the most important things at council is that you can't be an advocate, you've got to be a scientist. And so you're presenting the data as it is, what it says. Um, you're not trying to skew it towards one side or the other. Um, it's also on a local scale, and I think that's quite appealing. So national scales, when you get organizations that are operating across New Zealand, it's quite hard to write a rule that will apply across New Zealand consistently and have a good effect. It's not quite that hard to write a rule that will apply. It's still hard, but it's not quite that hard to write a rule that will apply across Otago. And you'll also know who you're dealing with. Um, it doesn't take long to get to know the people in Otago. Next. But I guess my favorite part of my job is probably the variety, to be honest. Um, I could be doing anything every, any given day, just about from helping out with data analysis to doing field work, to doing report writing, to sitting up giving presentations. And I think it's really nice that um, you might walk in one day thinking, oh, I've got a full day of coding. And next thing you know, um, you're handling a press release on high E. coli somewhere and you didn't know that was gonna happen. So it keeps you on your toes and it's quite nice to have that variety. And that's me. And next up to me. Um, so I'm Rachel Ozan. I'm a resource scientist at Tiger Regional Council. And I thought I'd bore you a bit by just saying how it all fits in. Um, I'm not going to take long. But um, really, the big umbrella is the Resource Management Act, which I'm sure you all know. National policy statements come out from time to time, and I think we're expecting another one on Monday, which we'll have to take note of. Um, and then Otago Regional Council has regional policy statements, and that flows down to the water plan. So my job, a lot of my job, um, is looking after the monitoring side of things, which is um, an obligation under the Resource Management Act. Um, but it does have heaps of other things apart from being required to do it. Um, it's, a, it's a way of monitoring the effect of, effectiveness of the Targa Regional Council's plans. And it lets us see how we're doing. You know, are things getting better? Are things getting worse? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? Um, and what's going on? That sort of stuff. So just to give you an indication of, of the scale of what we do at ORC, the left map shows our water quality monitoring sites. There's about 100 or so of them, and they're monitored monthly. They're monitored monthly so that we can get a really clear idea of the state and trend of the water resources in the area. And um, it's fairly limited. We only do bacteria, nutrients, and so on. Um, and you can see that we've got different colours there, it's sort of how we split Otago up. Um, and also we monitor lakes as well, the big lakes in central Otago and the smaller coastal ones as well. And the graph on the map on the right is our ecological monitoring sites. And there's far fewer of them because it takes so much more time and investment, really. Um, so we're looking at things like algae and sediment, macroinvertebrates. Um, we do habitat assessments at most of them. And there's a separate program looking at freshwater fish. Um, next slide. So yeah, we, we are out in the field a wee bit. And it doesn't look that glamorous really when you're looking at periphyton or algae, you're, you're doing the top left hand um, component, which is scraping rocks. And you think, why on earth did I do a degree or so to scrape rocks. But actually, when you know why, when you're doing it, you, you understand the logic of it. Um, but it's sort of a slightly primary school, if you think about it. But anyway, then all the, all the invertebrates, hugely important in the ecology of rivers. Um, are there stone flies, mayflies, etc.? Is it full of worms? Um, so the whole um, gambit of ecological stuff um, it's really important in monitoring the health of the river alongside the, um, alongside the water quality. The lake monitoring, I thought I'd touch on that because we've got some cool photos actually. Um, 
so the we've got a monitoring buoy in Lake Hayes in central Otago, and that does continual um, continuous profiles from the top of the lake down to the bottom of the lake, and it just goes on and on and on, collecting data which we have to analyse. Um, and the got a cool probe on the right hand side. You can just you can just see it, which men monitors all sorts of um, all sorts of parameters, temperature, chlorophyll, and so on. Um, and also we look at zooplankton and we look at phytoplankton and we provide information for other people for other um, CRIs. So we look at a, we tow for lake snow and provide that information for land research. And in fact, the lake monitoring program um, probably collects more data for other agencies than it does for Otago Regional Council. So we're quite collaborative in that sense. And that's quite fun because you know that our information that we're collecting is feeding into the national picture. And that's just an example of the profiles that we get from Lake Hayes. Um, different different colours means different, yeah, different levels of oxygen. I won't I won't bother about that one too much. Next. So the other thing, I'm sure you've heard of it, all of the Targa, most of the Targa Regional's data, water quality data goes onto the LAWA website, which is quite cool. Um, and then MFE take that, all that data, and provide a national picture. Of water quality in New Zealand. Um, so you know that all the data that ORC people collect in the field is all feeding up into the New Zealand's national picture of how we are water quality or macroinvertebrates or recreational bathing sites, that sort of thing. And why here? How come I'm here? Same as Jason. You know, you know from my accent, I don't belong here, but I actually do now. It's taken, I've been here for about 20 years. Um, so I've got the relevant degrees. Um, my first one I did in Birmingham in the middle of the UK. Then I went to, uh, I did a, quite a lot of overseas travel after that actually, but eventually I came back um, and did my second degree in London. And actually part of that MSc was a um, job placement with the National Rivers Authority. And I was just lucky and fortunate that they kept me on after that job placement. So I had about eight years in London or south of England. Um, and I covered a whole gambit of things from fisheries and ecology, tidal water, fresh water. It gave me a really good broad understanding of environment, you know, of environmental um in, of in, environment um, after that i moved to guernsey and took up a position as guernsey is a little island for those of you who don't know between france and england part of the channel islands um, and i took up a job which um on the they have a water board there but that gave me a really good grounding in drinking water management and looking after their drinking water reservoirs and uh, cyanobacteria blooms and managing algae and all that sort of thing. After that, I, yeah, we went to Kiribati in the middle of the Pacific and did a couple of years of sustainable aquaculture, which actually means growing seaweed, um, which was quite cool. It was a good experience. Then I ended up in Otago um, and managed to get a job at Otago Regional Council as a water quality scientist, which we thought we'd do for I don't know, I thought I'd do for a year or two, but actually I've been here now for 16 years. Um, why have I stuck with it? And it's because Otago is such a cool place. Um, it's a region with it all. You don't get many places in the world where you can go from alpine to arid in a matter of, you know, 100k. And it's a beautiful region. So that's me. Um, and as you can see, I, I have been to all sorts of places and traveled quite a lot and gave, gained a broad wealth of experience. Um, and I'd encourage you to do that. You can see right in the middle of my career, I took off and did some weird stuff in the middle of the Pacific. It doesn't actually matter. It's all experience. Um, and if you're trying to find a job, that's what employers tend to look at because you stand out. Um, so don't be frightened of doing something a bit odd. Thank you. Well, hi everybody. Um, my name's Lauren Hunter and I work as an environmental data officer um, in the environmental monitoring team. 
Um, so uh, just a little bit of context about myself. I also studied at the University of Otago uh, and I graduated about four and a half years ago. So still quite new to uh, the workforce. Um, I completed a BSc in physical geography uh, with particular interest in climatology and biogeography. Awesome. So um, not too long ago, I was in the same position as you where you don't necessarily know what to do with yourself once you graduate. Um, I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to work as an environmental data officer um, and I have continued to work there for the last four years. Um, but you're probably thinking, what does an environmental data officer do? Well, together we work with the field technicians who carry out all the field work. So they are the ones who do all the water sampling, the river flow measurements and maintenance at our monitoring sites. And we effectively do the office part of their job. Um, as a collective team, we ultimately are the data collectors for the likes of the scientists, um, as well as uh, the general public. From this diagram, uh, you can see that we do complete a variety of tasks, uh, including processing of water quality results, which come in from the which, sorry, which come in from the laboratory. Uh, we validate hydrological data, which has been verified by a technician site visit. We complete uh, daily checks to ensure that the data which is coming in uh, to our website and uh, is, is, is all good and make sure it looks correct. Uh, and I'm sure a few of you will have asked for data for projects you've worked on at the university. Uh, so we also provide data out to the public. Um, however, no role at the ORC is static, and that's one of the things that I love most. Um, for me personally, the role has grown to also include a number of other tasks, including the developing of a field app for the field text to use in, uh, instead of paper forms, uh, project managing the air quality network and being able to complete maintenance on some of, some of the machines. I also present reports on the quality of our hydrological data to the rest of the environmental monitoring team. I'm also now an active member of the ORC's flood monitoring team, so I help out during high flow events in the Otago region and sometimes manage to get out of the office and help the field techs with site maintenance, water sampling or flow measurements. So I'm now just going to give you um, or show you a few examples of some of the applications and technologies that we use. So this here is a uh, the, the current interface of our environmental monitoring field app. So we're still developing it, but um, it's currently at a usable stage, so we'll continue to develop it over, the, over time. Now this is an example of what we call a rating curve. Uh, to give you a little bit of background knowledge, the field techs take river flow measurements each time they visit a monitoring site. And each of these flow measurements are then imported into our software and they automatically plot somewhere on the graph. Uh, we then adjust the rating curve uh, to try and make all of the flow measurements plot on the curve. However, this doesn't always happen, so sometimes we have to make a new curve. And these rating curves are especially important during flood events and during irrigation seasons. Uh, we at the ORC need to provide as accurate information to the public as we can, uh, especially in high flows for if people need to move stock or even evacuate from their homes, or um, in low flow seasons, to make sure that there is enough water for all landowners. So this is the insight of one of our new optical air quality monitors, which measures both PM10 and PM2.5. So for part of the maintenance, uh, it requires the machine to be completely pulled apart and have the optics cleaned. Uh, this is to ensure that the recorded information we share uh, for decision making and policies uh, is as accurate as possible. This is our current water sampling software. So the field techs enter the metadata and the results are imported by the labs. We then go through and check this information is correct. So the likes of Rachel and Jason can use it in scientific reports uh, and how it's been quality, uh, quality checked. Awesome, so this is um, the sort of graph you would typically see on our water info website. So this graph uh, shows flow and various flood warnings, but we also do graphs for water levels, groundwater levels, air quality parameters and rainfall information. 
and we also update these graphs every 10 minutes to give the public as up-to-date information as we can. And lastly, this is an example of one of our, hydrolog uh, sorry, our hydrology monitoring sites um, on the Kadrona River. Uh, so it's currently got a stilling well tower which houses the monitoring equipment. There's an aerial which communicates information back to all of our officers all over the region. There's two staff gauges so that field techs can measure the water at low and high flow. And it's also got, I don't know if you can see, it's got a, a line across the river section which is what we call a tagline, and we use this um, for taking flow measurements easily and safely during high flow events. And that's us. Hi everyone, so I'm um, Sam, a coastal scientist at uh, the Regional Council here. Um, so similar to Karen earlier, I've only just started uh, January, I started a week later than uh, Karen, so what, four months in the, the role now. Um, so yeah, a bit of background. I, a long while ago, did a BSc at Otago University in zoology um, and ecology. Uh, well, back then you couldn't do an undergrad in marine science. I know that's now changed. Um, following that, I went on and did a master's in marine science straight after the bachelor, focusing on um, marine ecology and fisheries. Um, after that, I uh, went to Europe following my now wife and uh, first up was, uh, surprisingly enough, taught English in the Czech Republic for about a year and a half, uh, even though I barely speak it properly. So that was an experience. And then I went on to uh, Ireland where we lived for a while. And I worked for Inland Fisheries Ireland, which was, um, it was quite interesting getting experience with the EU and um, their policy over there and it's quite applied science so I worked across estuaries, lakes and rivers in that role. Um, then we came back to New Zealand and I worked up in Nelson for plant and food research on the uh, precision seafood harvesting which basically is a, a project which looked at trawl te net technologies and how to improve the sustainability and the efficiency of um, trawl technologies to improve fish quality, but also reduce the impact on the environment. And so I did that for quite a, a few years, which was a lot of fun, a lot of sea time. So some interesting experience on fishing boats. And um, after that, I kind of wanted to sort of change roles and uh, my, my parents are farmers, so I'm quite interested in the effects of land and runoff. So I managed to get a PhD funded from um, Environment Southland and the Sustainable Seas Tipping Points back in uh, at Otago University, looking at sediments and nutrients and the influence on estuaries and how changing levels affect estuaries. And so that was for the past three years and I pretty much got uh, the role at here at Otago Regional Council as a coastal scientist right as I was finishing up my PhD. And I think, like how Rachel said earlier, I think experience and how you get to the end position is, is you try try whatever you can and you don't have to have a set pathway. Um, but if you are more into the applied science, which I am, rather than say going down the academic pathway, um, it's I think it's important to think about your masters, but probably more importantly, if you do a PhD to think about it so that you look at a project this is speaking from a marine ecology side of things, you look at projects which are more eco ecology based or ecosystem based rather than narrow it down. You know, blue sky science is great. I mean, you know, maybe looking at dolphins and how they talk to each other is interesting, but unless you're going to go down an academic pathway, it's not that relevant to sort of the more applied world. Um, yeah, next. Yeah, so that's sort of where it comes into variety as a coastal scientist. So I, I am new in the role, so I haven't had a, a long time here. Um, but the jurisdiction of the, well, there's the RMA, as I think Rachel mentioned, is the top level document influencing kind of the direction of work I do, followed by the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. So the coastal space, which ORC has a jurisdiction over, is from the mean high water spring mark. Uh, out to 12 nautical miles off the coast. So there's quite a variety of sort of ecosystems and habitats within that area. And so this involves 
state of environment monitoring, which is estuaries are obviously a big part and a lot of focus is on that um, from seagrass mapping and looking at sediment parameters, macrofauna, um, there's aspects of data management and biodiversity monitoring within estuaries, which is the macrofauna to see how they change in relation to land use impacts. But equally, there's also the open coast to look at and um, requires mapping of the significant areas so then you know where to sort of focus work on to reduce impacts. But of course, as you're probably aware, the coastal side of the marine work is is very expensive and costs uh, a lot of logistics. So this is where it's good to work collaboratively with other organisations um, for everyone involved to get the best results to share resources. So quite a cool part is I'm currently uh, starting to work in with the Marine Department where I did my PhD with uh, DOC, with Naitahu to, to get projects up and running. I think that's sort of a cool part of the variety as a coastal scientist is that you, you one day you could be working in estuaries, data management in the office, the next day you get to collaborate with other institutes as well as join in national projects because it is a space which hasn't had a lot of work done across the board. So there's a lot of projects whether it's big national ones run by NIWA, which we can be a part of in Otago, because as a as an organisation which uses that data to make policy and um, manage the environment, you've got to be involved with those big projects to find out the learnings. But equally, on the ground, you get to monitor the environment to see what's happening. So, yeah, this this data all leads into policy and management of the coastal area. And yeah, that's that's pretty much my talk. Cheers. Hello, so we've just got another quick video to show you. There's two qualities that really stick out for me, and that's openness and honesty. And if you can get a decent day's work out of your staff and they're open and honest, we can build really good teams around that. The main value that speaks to me for the Regional Council is trustworthiness um, and that intertwines with caring um, because I like the community to think that the staff at the Regional Council care about them as a community because we're also members of that community. The value that gives me um, the most connection is, is the open and honest section really. I think we're, we're in a, a public arena and we're delivering a public function and I think open, being open and uh, honest in what you do, how you do it, um, you know, from the start of a, a, an inquiry or a project right through to the finish, um, I think is a really key element of what we deliver. The value that really aligns with me is probably trustworthy and that's because it kind of wraps in a few of the values for me. So you can trust that I'll be open and honest and that's a really cool personal value of mine, really relevant to the work that I'm doing. Um, you can trust that I'll be collaborative, working across teams. I'm a business partner, so I have a business partner with the managers, the organisation, the directors, basically everyone. So yeah, trust really, really resonates with me. I think the one I, um, I relate most to is open and, and honest. I think that's the core of, um, of any healthy relationship, either internally but also externally with the different group we're working with. The two that mean the most to me are being accountable and um, being open and honest because I think they intertwine quite quite well together. So like in our job, if someone rings up being able to say, sorry, I don't know that answer, but I'll make sure that I get someone that, that can and following that through. So the values that leapt out to me from the list were caring and creative. Caring, because I think that's at the soul of what we do, both caring for people and caring for the environment, which I think are both really fundamental and important. And creative because I think that's the way that we have to head as a public service organisation. Right, so um, we just wanted to be able to give you guys a little bit of an opportunity to ask any questions if you have any of our lovely scientists, so um, feel free to go ahead if you do. No one has any questions at all. I've, I've oh, fabulous. A couple. Go Fox. Didn't want to take it away from everybody else, but um, thanks for coming everybody. Appreciate it. Um, I wanted to talk about 
becoming a field technician and their role for the ORC. Has anybody got any experience in that field that's here today? That's probably going to go to Lauren, I would imagine. Lauren, are you comfortable answering that? Yeah, I think so. Yep. So, um, what, what's involved is they, they probably spend three to five days out in the field just going around all of our monitoring sites, um, making sure that they um, are working correctly. Uh, they, like I said, they also take flow measurements at the sites. Um, they do any maintenance, surveying of sites to make sure that um, nothing's moving. Um, what else do they do? Uh, take water samples for the scientists. Uh, that's, that's a big part of their job. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really just making sure that all the monitoring equipment is working uh, so that the scientists can, can uh, be, yeah, be given really the information for, for high flows, low flows, all the bits in between. It's also important. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Anyone else? Or any follow up to that? I had one minor thing. Yeah. But I just wanted to know if I could, Jason, could I reach out to you after this and send you an email about some America specific questions, if you wouldn't mind? Yep, go for it. That's all good. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, sorry, and now you had a question, Octavian, is it? Uh, yeah, I did have a question actually. Um, so I noticed that um, most of you guys, I think most of you uh, had uh, masters, uh, postgraduate studies done. Um, so I was just wondering what sort of opportunities are there for um, someone who's thinking about doing a master's but doesn't really want to go into that straight away right after finishing an undergraduate um, degree. Who would like to answer that from our team? I, I might have something to say. Um, I don't have a master's or a PhD unlike everybody else. So. Um, just having an undergraduate degree does not mean you can't go out and get some job experience. Um, so mm -hmm. if, if you want to go and do your master's later, then I, I would definitely recommend just putting yourself out there. Because um, yeah, like everyone else said, getting some job experience is really important. So just give it a go. Yep. Yeah. Um, and like, also, um, sorry. Um, no, I was just going to say, I think like, um, Kieran might be able to add something to that. Um, as he's currently oh, yeah, sure. completing his master's while he's working with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I found myself in perhaps a similar position that you are uh, saying at the moment. Um, when I finished my Bachelor of Science, I was really keen to get out there and get working um, and not that keen to knuckle down in an academic sense. And uh, so that's exactly what I did. Um, but that didn't mean that while I was working, I wasn't seeking sort of um, studying part time on top of that. And so after I'd been in my doc job for, I don't know, seven years or something like that, I signed up to do the postgrad diploma in wildlife management at Otago University and, and I was doing that part time. And then since then, I've, I've um, added in my Master of Science, which I'm working towards completing now whilst working. Um, so don't be afraid, I guess to um, ex explore different options about getting towards a science role um, in terms of gaining experience either through employment or through ac academic pathways. Um, employ, I, I think employers will generally sort of favour both of those avenues being explored um, and you, you tend to pick up a broader set of skills from exploring both of those pathways. But yeah, that, that's... Okay. I think I'd yep. even add on to that slightly more from a broader council perspective. Um, certainly councils do have, um, I wouldn't call it a scheme by any means, but you do see people go from sort of the general field staff through to junior scientist roles, through to scientist roles, through to senior scientist roles um, in the sector. And the thing is, no matter what you do, you aren't going to short circuit it. Um, so if you have a PhD, it doesn't mean you're going to slot straight into a senior scientist role. And if you come in with a bachelor's and you put in your 10 years of work or whatever that you might do doing a master's and then a PhD and then a postdoc or what have you, um, you could well end up in the same scientist role in the same amount of time either way. Um, it's just how you're going to put in the hard yards um, and taking the opportunities that come. So you, one, you might have to move a bit more than the other. It's just kind of what comes. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, and also, what about um, sort of practical experience uh, straight out of university? Like, would that typically be enough or would we need to do other things while we're at university to get more experience? The more you have, the better off you are. <laughs> yeah. Honest. So if you're coming um, with sort of... degree, it is what it is. If you're coming with an internship that you've done or volunteered with Doc or whoever, and you've got references from that, that's great. Um, and the more yep. you've done, the better off you are in terms of getting that first job. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Anyone else? I see there's a question in the chat, actually. Oh, I couldn't get the chat to come up. I was trying. Ah, I, would you like me to read that? That would be amazing. Okay, so the, it's for, is it Mega? Mega? Um, would like to know, was there a skill when you applied for a job that you thought you should have had on your CV? Sam, you can answer that one. Um, I don't, was there a skill when you applied for a job? I thought you should have. Uh, well, I, I mean, I sort of put all the skills down which I had on my CV. So, uh, to try and match to what the, the job position was. Um, so I, I, I don't know really there were, whether there was a skill I should have put down. Um, I think the main thing when you're writing your CV is to try and match as much as you can uh, the the role description to your skills and how that how how that factors in rather than just listing your skills as such. You need to try and focus on the key ones. But yeah, I couldn't couldn't think of a skill which I should have had down, which I didn't. To be fair, anyone else? I can comment on it. I routinely tell friends that are looking for council jobs that are just finishing up their PhD that um, I think it's quite funny because when we all apply for a council job, um, we all think, boy, it would be so nice if I had all the skills of somebody that had just worked a council job on my CV. And boy, wouldn't it be. But quite frankly, unless there's somebody that has just worked a council job applying, um, in which case you're now in a tough applicant pool because that person does have exactly those skills. Um, unless they're in that applicant pool, just put down what you've got and like Sam said, try to match them to the description because that's the best thing you can do. I mean, one thing that I could possibly state from the recruitment side of thing, things is we do look at people who have had previous local government experience because local government's a little bit different to central government or even, you know, other more specialist private companies. Um, that's always good to have that little bit of extra knowledge and of course, um, a lot of it's to do with having really good um, experience with the Resource Management Act as well. Right, has anyone else got any questions? Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Um, I was wondering if there's anybody here that has any experience with the transport operations side of OIC? No, unfortunately, we're the, these lovely people are all scientists or environmental data, so we don't actually have anyone from our public transport. Um, but you can always reach out to us through our human resources um, email address, which is on our website. And if you've got any questions or you want to put in touch with someone from public transport, we can definitely facilitate that for you. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Right. Oh, yeah. One last one. Um, uh, who should I reach out to within this clade of people about groundwater specifically in the South D or Dunedin region? I have questions about that. I can honestly say not me, so I don't know. I'm looking at. <laughs> uh, so, so we do have a couple of groundwater people um, in the science team, but also we've got people in the natural hazards team, which is another mm. branch of council that, um, that work quite closely with the scientists. So again, if you if you want to get hold of them, I would just um, again email the human resources people, or if you're if you're talking to Jason later, he'll um, he'll tell you who they are, and um, yeah, and just get hold of them. Cool. Okay. Thanks. I'll just quickly use this as an opportunity too. I was going to say it later, but we will be having summer cadet chips hopefully coming up this year. 
Um, and also we're going to be having quite a few roles being advertised in the coming months, um, not only um, in our science and environmental, but also in our engineering and other teams. So keep an eye on our website um, as there'll be more coming up. Anyone else have any more questions? Um, I have one more, more question. Um, so I'm majoring in chemistry and environmental management. Um, what sort of roles would would be most appropriate for um, that kind of study? Um, Thank you, Thanks, Jason. <laughs> yeah, I'd say Jason would be the most uh, relevant for that. Um, so depending on chemistry, if you're on like that, you know, chemical creation side of things like pharmacology sort of stuff, um, that's probably a rough sell. If you're on the more environmental chemistry side of things with that environmental management degree, well, that sun is nice. Um, it's quite easy. You can have roles in compliance. You could have a role in consenting. Um, quite a few of our consenting people have the environmental management degree. Um, Perhaps water quality, probably to a lesser degree. I would guess compliance and consenting would probably be the place to start. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was just going to add to that. So yeah, it depends on the chemistry side, but environmental management from the marine perspective. Um, obviously, ocean acidification is a hot topic, and whether it's council kind of work. Um, I don't think many councils are currently sort of a actively working too much in that space, but across the board, there's a lot happening in the marine work and marine chemists are fairly highly sought after in fact it's hard to get a good marine chemist across institutes like whether it's Cawthron, Niwa or you know councils who might have funding to 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 get a an ocean acidification person which I don't think exists in a council but um yeah marine marine chemistry or that side of things definitely in high demand um so yeah as Jay said with it combined with environmental management there's a lot of money getting in, put into that space. For um, you can have a look at the news. Uh, is it the National Sustainable Seas, the National Science Challenge, which is the phase two of that's about to start. I know. I just saw six PhDs advertised at Waikato and two at Otago, all marine related, and some might have chemistry related uh, aspects to them. Yeah. So you've yeah. got to convey with that sort of degree conglomerate is that you've got a really solid understanding of nutrient cycling and pollution in aquatic yeah uh, and unfortunately that, uh <laughs> there was a an environmental chemistry paper that uh, a third year paper um but they got rid of that because it was having it just wasn't a very well <laughs> um done paper but i did uh analytical chemistry last year um and then they, they told me that the closest thing to environmental chemistry that they're doing at the moment is forensic chemistry, which I'm meant to be doing next semester. But honestly, there's, it's more like, yeah, it's more just like quite general sort of chemistry, like organic and yeah. there's not too much applied stuff, I wouldn't say. Well, if you can get into a job where you can find a bit of applied experience or work with someone on that, yeah. you can pick it up pretty quick and then you're good to go. It's just a matter of... cool picking up those few missing skills and then joining them and presenting them in a way that everyone kind of goes, oh, okay, that's totally good. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Did anyone else have any comments to make or questions? No? No. Oh, well, it just, perhaps that just remains for me to say thank you. Thank you so much to the oh. team. RC for coming along and sharing your stories. I really liked the, diver the, the you know, divergent career paths that you've all taken. It's so interesting. And thank you to your students for, for um, attending. It's great to see you here. Um, and just a wee flag flying for the Career Development Centre. We are very happy to promote any of your opportunities, Jack, when, you, when you're ready. Brilliant. You know, we'll promote them for you. Um, and students, you know that we're there for you to help with your applications for anything. If you want your CV looked at or to jump into an interview skills workshop or whatever it may be, we're, we're here for you as well. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you yeah. Um, so this is just finally just any of our phone numbers and also there is a link there to our um, careers page as well. Great. So you can see the three ones we've currently got live, but um, hopefully there'll be more up soon.
Thank Brilliant. You. Thanks so much for having us. All right. No, it's our pleasure. Thank you for coming. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jack. I'll be in touch. Yeah, I was about to say thanks, Lucy. That was yeah, it was that was really good. That was quite enjoyable. And I'm they actually yeah, looked just, enthused about it. So that was pretty cool as they well. They did. It was none great. of them were and like none of them had their phones, so that's always a good start. <laughs> it's always a good test, isn't it? I know, I know, right? <laughs> hey, um look, I'm happy to help as well if anyone has any questions about sort of specific um local yeah. government or CVs or anything like that, I can help out as well. Um, I'm only gonna be in this role until mid July when my fixed term comes oh. up. Oh, I know, I know. Are you covering parental leave or something? Um, no, I wasn't, but they're going to be looking for more of an HR generalist, whereas I just do normally learning and development and um, recruitment oh. and those sort of bits oh, and pieces. Okay. So they're looking for someone yeah. with a sort of, and someone who can do full time as well. At the moment, I'm limited to 35 hours um, right. due to my children. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, till then, oh. I'm more than happy if anyone has anything yeah. and they want to try to tailor it more towards. Um, local government or council we're happy to help Lovely. and also thank they're you. more than welcome to i'll send you through i don't think i've sent it to our human resources um email address as well in case i've got oh that'd be good yeah then yep. they can just flick them straight to us and i can direct them where they need to go perfect great wonderful and if you see any so jobs right. come up in the career development give me a yell um, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, have you got anything, where, where, where are you going next? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I haven't got that far through. Um, I've got about two months left, so I'm not too stressed about it at the moment. Oh, look, something, something will turn up. up. Something exactly. always turns up. Exactly. I've actually come, before I, before I joined the Career Development Centre, I was with the recruiting team here at the university. Oh, nice. And I loved it. They're yeah. a team. Um, so yeah, if anything, ever I keep on watching, even through all my fixed term, I've kept on watching the year to see because I loved yeah. working there as well when I was at the international office. It was brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll keep an eye out um, yeah. and go from there. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, brilliant. All right, I'll flick that through <laughs> oh, to you. And thanks so much great. for your help, Lucy. All right, all right, Cheers. take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.